Thanks very much. Um, I'm going to ask a sort of interesting question, I think, which is where are all the aliens? Um, which might, I am a scientist, I, I, I'm not crazy, but I actually think maybe there are aliens around. And I want to sort of convince you that this is a worthwhile scientific question um, to ask. Um, but I think, first of all, we need to appreciate how big space is. I think the best answer that I ever heard was in uh, The Hitchhiker's Guides of the Galaxy, Douglas Adams, that space was, was big, uh, very big. Uh, extremely big. We really don't know, don't know how big it is, but let's get, let's get a little uh, chance to understand that. This is the sun, um, even occasionally spotted from here in Manchester, uh, but uh, the sun is about 150 million kilometres away, uh, which is a bit hard to imagine. The, the, the earth is about 12,000 kilometres across, so 150 million kilometres is, is, a, is a large distance. One of the things we tend to do is we think about um, how long would it take to get to somewhere if we travelled at a certain speed, um, so, in this case, the fastest we can travel is the speed of light. So that's about um, uh, 300,000 kilometres every second. And at that speed, um, you would get to the sun in about eight minutes. So, in fact, when you look at the sun, um, that light has taken eight minutes to reach you, which is, you know, um, the sort of length of time you're in here listening to part of one of these talks, or so not too long. Um, but space is obviously bigger than that. If we go out into our Milky Way galaxy, our Milky Way galaxy has many suns, many stars. Um, hundreds of billions of, of stars. So, you know, if we shared all the stars out in the Milky Way between all the people on the Earth, we'd all get about 50 each, basically. It's that sort of number of stars in our Milky Way galaxy. And the nearest other star uh, to the Sun, that light that took eight minutes to reach us from the Sun, it's on its way now. When I started talking, some light set off from the Sun and it'll, it'll get there about halfway, get here about halfway through this talk. Um, if that light sort of passed by the Earth, uh, and we waited for that light to get to the nearest other star, uh, we'd be sitting here listening to my talk uh, for about four years. Um, so probably not the best thing to, uh, to be doing. So huge, vast distances between the stars. And across the whole of our Milky Way galaxy, um, that, 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 that light would take 100,000 years to cross it with, with those hundreds of millions of stars within it. Actually, that picture there is, is a galaxy. It's not our galaxy. It's the nearest big spiral galaxy to our own. It's called the Andromeda Galaxy. Um, so it's the nearest other big, large galaxy like the Milky Way. Um, and the light from those stars that you see in that picture, you can actually see this if you know where to look. Um, you can look, you can actually see the centre of this galaxy just with an unaided eye. You don't even need a telescope, a little fuzzy blob. That light that you can see from the centre of that galaxy um, takes two and a half million years to reach us. So you see back in time two and a half million years when you look at um, a galaxy like this. So, so space is big and this is just the nearest other galaxy. Um, what about if we're talking about life and we're asking the question about where, where are the aliens, um, we need to probably ask uh, where are the planets. Um, we, we, know, we only know of one example of life so far, life here on this planet. So we know there are many stars, we can see them shining uh, in the night sky. Um, but it's very hard to see the planets. Um, so do these stars, do these hundreds of millions of stars have planets orbiting them? They do, and we're living in a very in, uh, special time at the moment, actually, where um, 20 years or so ago, we found the first planet orbiting another star like the Sun. Uh, and I looked up what the number was uh, yesterday, uh, and the number now is 1,642 confirmed planets orbiting other stars. Um, so that's just the ones we found. By extrapolating that to all the stars in our Milky Way, we know there are billions and billions of planets in our Milky Way. Virtually every star you see in the night sky, in the night sky will be orbited by, by planets. Of course, you could ask the question, do those planets have life on them? Uh, and one of the key things there is whether um, uh, they're too close to their star, whether they be too hot. So, for example, liquid water is something we think is key to life here, here on Earth, the only example of life we have. Um, so if you were too close to your sun, it would be too hot, that water would, uh, would, would, would evaporate. If you were too far from your star, from your sun, then, um, then you would actually find that that water would freeze. And so you wouldn't have the liquid water, which we think would be essential for all the sort of biochemistry to go on that keeps us, uh, that allows us to be alive, to allow, to allow us to have life on Earth. Again, looking at what we found in our Milky Way alone with these, you know, uh, one and a half thousand confirmed planets so far, uh, we know there must be billions of so-called habitable planets just in our Milky Way galaxy. 
not in the Andromeda galaxy, the one I just showed you, this other galaxy, and not in the uh, not in the hundred billion other galaxies that we can see in the observable universe. Just in our own, there must be billions of habitable planets, potentially habitable planets. In other words, ones that are not too close to their star, not too hot, not too far away, not too cold, so they've got liquid water. Now, have aliens visited Earth? Who thinks aliens have visited the Earth? Oh, nobody's daring to put their hands up. Okay, there's, there's quite a lot of people around the planet who do believe aliens visit the Earth and visit the Earth all the time and indeed uh, claim to have met them. But I don't think there's actually much good evidence for that. But it's sort of an interesting question. You know, might they have done? We've only, you know, we've only been around for, uh, well, you know, modern humans have not been around for that long at all in terms of the history of the planet, um, just a few hundred thousand years. Um, so might aliens have visited the Earth at some point? Well, here's an interesting sort of uh, thing to think about, and it's something we might, we might do in the future, which is to send out a fleet of what are called von Neumann probes. They're space probes um, that you send off, and they go out to search around other stars, to see what they can find around other stars. We've just discussed the fact that these stars are very far away. Even light takes uh, four years to reach just the nearest other star. Um, and we can't make things travel at the speed of light. The fastest spacecraft travel at something like um, uh, 60,000 kilometres an hour or that sort, of, that sort of speed, a small fraction of the speed of light. So imagine sending out one of these space probes. It's travelling at, that's a fraction of the speed of light. Um, that's the sort of speed we can, we can send things out at the moment. It would take it, you know, maybe 50,000, 100,000 years to reach the nearest other star. But when it gets there, what it does is it self-replicates. So it gets there, and maybe along the way it gathers material. It gathers material from the stuff between the stars. And maybe when it gets to the, a planet around one of those stars, it gathers more material, and it builds a copy of itself. Um, and then actually, those spacecraft set off again, and they head off in different directions, and they go to the next other stars. And when they get there, each of those self-replicates and sends off again. This is not sounds a bit like science fiction, but in fact it's possible to imagine that we would be able to do this in the not too distant future. And again, if you work out how long this takes, you can calculate how long this process would take, um, you could actually explore the whole galaxy in less than 100 million years. <laughs> now, to an astronomer, that sounds quite quick. <laughs> because um, the Earth is about five billion years old, four and a half billion years old, four and a half thousand million years. This was less than a hundred million years, and you can speed it up by making multiple copies or making them travel a bit faster. Um, so this is actually short on the lifetime of a planet like the Earth or on the lifetime of the stars that are in the galaxy. So if you imagine that there might be life on these other planets that might be doing this, um, one interesting question is, where are the aliens? If there had been a civilization before us that were able to do this, might they have done this? Might we have actually been visited by these fleets of probably robot spacecraft self-replicating and spreading through the galaxy? We, don't see, we haven't seen any evidence for that, but it's an interesting question. We've not been here for very long in the history of the Earth. Is it something we should be looking for? It's called the Fermi paradox. If aliens exist, where, where are they? Um, because really this, this is actually not too long to populate the galaxy. So how are we going to look for life on other planets? Um, well, um, one of the ways to look for intelligent life, and I'm only going to talk about intelligent life here, uh, and that's because um, we know um, that on the history of life on Earth, most, most of that time life was um, bacterial life, so it was basically microbes for billions of years before it evolved into anything complicated like plants or animals or even intelligent life like <laughs> us. So um, it may well be that bacterial life is common, but if we were interested in intelligent life, if we wanted a conversation with some of these aliens, one of the ways we might do it is by using a radio telescope. This is the one at Jodrell Bank, uh, where I work, the Lovell Telescope, and this is just a recording of the sort of signal we pick up with that telescope. Obviously, as a radio astronomer, I could listen to this all day. <laughs> but maybe you might get a little bit bored. It just sounds like hiss. It's just noise. That's actually radio waves. In that case, it was radio waves that came from a star that exploded uh, in about the year 1670 as it happened. But, you know, you can't really hear much. It just sounds like noise. If you were expecting to 
pick up a signal from aliens, you'd probably expect something a bit more complicated in that signal than just that, than just that noise. And here's an example of something that was picked up not long after we started to think about using radio telescopes, big ones like the, the Lovell telescope there at Jodrell was built in 1957. So in the 1960s, we started to use these telescopes to look out for messages, maybe Morse code type messages buried in that, in that noise. And just a few years after that, in 1967, one of these signals was picked up. And here again is a recording made with our telescope uh, pointed at a particular direction in the sky. So this is a bit of a surprise. If you've been used to hearing the noise, the hiss, the shh, to hear, to see the regular radio flashing of an object in the invisible sky would be quite a surprise. And actually that first um, object that was discovered by Jocelyn Bell at Cambridge University in 1967, that first um, thing was called uh, Little Green Man 1, LGM1 they called it, because they thought, you know, this is, this is possibly an alien signal. We actually now know that the remnants of exploded stars, the things called pulsars, very exotic objects that we use to test our understanding of physics and Einstein's um, theories, of, uh, theories of gravity. So not aliens, um, perhaps sadly, but exciting for physics all the same. What do we do uh, with other telescopes? Well, we use telescopes like this one. This is the Arecibo telescope. This is a, a, a massive radio telescope, the world's biggest radio telescope. Um, it's in a valley in Puerto Rico. Um, it's 300 meters in diameter. That makes it four times the size uh, in diameter of the, of the Lovell telescope at Jodrell Bank, a huge uh, telescope that's used uh, for lots of different things, but one of the things it does is a project called Serendip, which you might, some of you might know as SETI at home. Um, you can download a screensaver for your computer and it will basically process data looking for these sorts of extraterrestrial signals being picked up with a, with a radio telescope like that one. Another radio telescope around the world that has done and is doing this sort of work uh, is the Green Bank Telescope. This is in West Virginia. Um, this uh, telescope is about 100 metres in diameter. These large telescopes collect lots of radio waves. Um, they see, or they, if you like, they hear very faint things uh, coming from the distant universe. And so these are the sorts of things we might be interested in using to pick up extraterrestrial signals. And this one's been used to search out those, look in the direction of those planets that we, that we know of. The Parkes Telescope here um, is uh, in Australia. Again, uh, this telescope and the Greenback Telescope are involved in a new project looking for these extraterrestrial signals called the Breakthrough Listen Project. Um, our own telescopes here in the UK, we started a project with these telescopes, a network of telescopes spread across the country between here and um, between Jodrell Bank uh, and all the way out to Cambridge, seven radio telescopes all connected by optical fibres linked together to act as one giant telescope and again amongst all the other things we're doing we're starting to look through those signals looking for potential uh, extraterrestrial signals. And what's coming in the future is an amazing telescope we're designing at the moment. It's called the Square Kilometre Array. It's going to be built in Southern Africa and Australia. It's going to be made up of hundreds of dishes connected together and other types of aerials connected together uh, that will make a giant um, telescope whose, whose size is equivalent to uh, uh, 220 times the size of the Lovell Telescope at Jodrell Bank. It will be able to see incredibly uh, faint things in the universe, pick up incredibly weak signals. And in terms of looking for aliens, uh, in just one minute, that telescope will be able to look, for, uh, look at every star in the direction it's pointing out to about 300 light years away from us. So the nearest of the star was four light years. It will be able to get 300 light years away, searching every star in just a minute for the sorts of uh, strong signals that come from um, those, the radar systems that we use in our big telescopes. So if there are aliens out there with this sort of technology, and if there's messages, there's signals coming our way, this telescope is going to be a, an amazing facility for us to be able to uh, detect those signals. So I'm afraid I, I can't, what I can't do is give you the answer to my question at the beginning, which is where are all the aliens? We, we don't know, we haven't detected aliens uh, anywhere. We do believe, we do know there are potentially habitable planets. That's a, that's a fact that wasn't, we didn't know that 20 years ago, we know that now. We have got the technology and we will have the technology that is allowing us to search ever greater bits of our uh, galaxy, searching for the sorts of signals from technology, from the technology we produce, the, 
uh, the radar systems that we use in airports and so on, uh, looking out for these uh, signals that might be coming from aliens. And I hope, I do hope, uh, that at some point in the not too distant future, uh, we will be able to answer uh, this question of are we alone in the universe. Thanks very much.